to this conversation. Uh, as you've just seen, we're gonna be recording this meeting uh, so that people who aren't able to join us uh, at this time can log in. Um, but it's my great pleasure to welcome you. My name is Jody Sanford and I'm the Dean of the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. Um, and this is our Dean's Forum on Race and Public Policy. Uh, it's the fourth of such meetings and really started because I think one of the roles of public universities are to talk about important ideas and plant the seeds really for courageous action. So I think we are committed to keeping um, front and center the ideologies of white supremacy and imperialism that are kind of baked into our policies and our institutions. And I think it's important that we acknowledge what is so that we can plan for what should be. Um, and that is really the intent of this series that we have. So if you enjoy what you learned today, uh, continue to tune in as we uh, have this series over time. Um, as most of you know, because you're Zoom experts, uh, muting is great. Uh, if you can have your videos on, that's wonderful. Um, we're going to be asking you to put chat in uh, questions you have into the chat throughout, and we're going to be collecting them and integrating them into the conversation that I'm going to facilitate with our colleagues. Um, so we're going to have about 40 minutes to hear from the panelists and then open it up to the conversation we'll have together. Um, but before we begin today, I want to start by acknowledging that we here in Washington are on the land of the Coast Salish people. And we study and we work here at the University of Washington. And it's important to remember that their ancestors have re resided here since time immemorial and that people continue to live in this place today and deeply rooted in their cultural traditions. We also want to acknowledge that the country was built from the land theft and genocide of indigenous communities and the enslavement and forced labor of black people. And I obviously know that these kinds of acknowledgements are a small gesture but we wanna keep making them to recognize our responsibility to learn and share this history and to really build collaborative and accountable relationships together so that we can create more just public policy. And so now we turn to the topic of our forum. Um, as you all know, the, the focus here is trying to understand an anti-racist approach to child welfare policy. And this particular conversation came because I'm working with some colleagues who are on this meeting on a study of the implementation of some 2018 federal law that was really designed to improve services to families that are interacting with what is called the child welfare system. It struck me as I do that work that there are few more intrusive acts of state authority than removing children from their homes because of our need to keep them safe. And so I went back and looked at the data and remembered that since I started tracking child welfare for 25 years, there's been persistent racial disproportionality of black, brown and indigenous children in this system. At virtually every step from reporting what might be seen as abuse or neglect to investigating, to removing children from their home, to placing them in another setting like foster care, black, brown and indigenous kids are really overrepresented. It's true in Washington state and it's true in virtually all states. Um, some people argue that this is an overrepresentation of low income children. And yet, the writings of Ibrahim Kendi really remind us that if we have this kind of persistent disproportionality or disparities in outcomes, there, it's an indicator of racist policy at work. So, I thought that we should delve deeper into this. Um, and obviously, a lot of these themes have been a long concern for people in the field of social work. And so I'm really happy today to be partnering with the University of Washington's wonderful School of Social Work in this program. Um, and we also are in having this conversation at a time when a number of people, scholars, advocates, policymakers, are noting that we're poised for some bold federal change in this space. So I am really grateful that people are here um, and just would like to invite our panelists um, to introduce themselves uh, and really share what part of their expertise uh, they're bringing to the conversation we're about to have. So Tessa, do you want to go first? 
Sure, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here today. My name is Tess Evans Campbell, and I'm an enrolled member of the Snohomish Tribe, which is here in Western Washington, where I am. Um, and I'm bringing to the table not just myself as an Indigenous woman and mother, but um, and, and and someone who has ancestors that experienced boarding school and, and some of the, in, the really things that impacted Native children through the ages, um, but also my experience in child welfare work. Um, Currently, I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the School of Social Work in Seattle. And um, I, I have served on my tribal council for a number of years. Uh, I just got off last year, but I might be joining back again soon, so we'll see. Um, I also have spent a number of years doing Indian child welfare work. I did um, public child welfare work in LA County. Um, and I worked in adoptions and I worked with all the native families that were involved in adoptions at the time. Um, I served as a commissioner for the LA County Native American Commission and I was the commission's representative for the LA County Children's Planning Council at the time. Um, I also sit right now on the local Indian Child Welfare Advisory Committee and we review cases involving mostly urban native children that come into the system in King County. Um, so I bring a wealth of experience, and um, but I'm learning, and I'm just so glad to be here with you today. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tessa. John, do you want to introduce yourself and share the expertise you think you're bringing? Oh, you are muted, John. Yep, got me. Okay, um, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be invited to, to be on this panel. Um, I've been out in the field since 1971, actually. Um, I've held positions in nonprofit government agencies as a social worker, uh, supervisor, administrator, educator at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of uh, Project Legacy, a Minnesota nonprofit empowerment program for youth, young adults of color who lack a, a positive support system and offering a long, we offer a long-term trauma-informed mentoring, advocacy and supportive uh, service. And that flows really from the work that I've been doing since I came to Minnesota in 1997. Uh, I came to Rochester, Minnesota in, and was hired by Olmsted County as the first African-American social worker um, I started working in child protection, but I was also tasked with developing services for African-American families. Uh, in 1999, Minnesota uh, legislator, legislature uh, identified disproportionality or what they were calling then disparities in out-of-home placement of African-American children and formed a committee. And from 2000, well, 2000 until uh, the committee ended its work in uh, 2013, I was involved at the state level in uh, uh, exploring and developing strategies to deal with disparities and disproportionality. And that's really been, been my passion since I, I've been at Olmsted County and, and been working both again at the state, but also locally in developing our strategies and doing some analysis of what some of the issues are that are that are driving uh, these 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 numbers, uh, I currently supervise the family support unit of Olmsted County uh, in child and family services, and we're currently involved in a national two generation pilot entitled Pathways to Prosperity and Well Being, and essentially that's that's a, a intended to prove the concept that it's possible to lift people out of poverty and, and help them to achieve a place of thriving. But, and in so doing, it, it's helping families achieve economic stability, improve parent-child engagement, uh, and ameliorate disparities associated with poverty, race, and class. And implicit in that, up to this point, what's been implicit in that is the intent to um, address issues of equity. And one of the things we're looking at right now is really rather than it being implicit is making it an explicit uh, goal of the, of the pilot. So I guess I can say what, what brings me here is 
um, about a 20 year, well, almost 25 year uh, involvement in issues of, of disparities and disproportionality and uh, efforts to address that both at the county level and the state level. Thanks, so thanks for inviting me. Alan, can you introduce yourself and share a bit about your expertise that you're bringing to the conversation? Hi everyone, I'm Alan Detloff. I'm the Dean of the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston. Am I on? Hi everyone, I'm Alan Detloff. I'm Dean of the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston. Um, and I come to this work as an abolitionist. I come to this work as someone who began my career working in the child welfare system, which I believe is more accurately referred to as the family policing system. And I worked in that system as someone who spent many years forcibly removing children from their families as a means of what I thought was help at that time. Um, after I left the system, I spent many years coming to terms with the harm that I caused children and families and coming to understand my complicity in the disproportionate harm that was caused to mostly black and brown children and families. And I spent many years then afterwards as a reformer, as someone who tried, who did research and worked within state systems to try to reform the system, to try to make the system better and improve outcomes for black children and other children and families of color. And then eventually came to a place where I realized that because the system was founded on an ideology of white supremacy, and over the years, because of the extent to which racism and white supremacy were embedded in the system's policies and practices, that reforms simply aren't sufficient, that the racism and oppression that's embedded within the system's policies and practices are not something that can be reformed away. Um, and I believe that the only way to end the harm that's caused by children and families from the system is by complete elimination of the system and rethinking, reimagining, and in many cases, remembering ways in which we as a society can care for children, families, and communities in ways that don't involve forcible family separation and the harm that comes from that. And Angelique, what's the expertise that you bring? We're having mute problems here. <laughs> All right, I'll just unmute myself there. Can you hear me now? All right, perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angelique Day. I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Washington. I guess I'm uh, coming today with many, many hats. Uh, you know, first and foremost, um, I bring lived experience. Um, I am a product of the Michigan child welfare system with uh, growing up in a home that um, encountered many, many investigations and then experiencing removal and placement uh, in uh, um, unrelated foster care placement. Uh, and um, also had the opportunity in Michigan to uh, start at a very young age, uh, you know, uh, sharing uh, my voice and having an opportunity to be engaged in system reform. I worked for an organization called Michigan's Children and I'm I am blown away by the number of Michiganders who are joining us today. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate that you all are prioritizing this conversation today. Um, so I got my start in public policy in the state of Michigan um, and uh, uh, spent about six years uh, post MSW working on that um, in that capacity before joining academia and then had the opportunity um, through a national fellowship to actually uh, work on uh, legislation at the federal level with the US House of Representatives and uh, had the opportunity to develop uh, several uh, federal level bills that were introduced uh, in the House, of which a few of them have been signed into law. So it's an honor to be a part of that process. Um, so today uh, uh, you will hear me talk about those experiences. I have practice experience. Um, as a child protective service worker in the state of Michigan, I worked in uh, uh, state level, tribal level, and county level, so have done that work with all three levels. Um, so I'm super excited to share, you know, from a policy uh, perspective, uh, how that's looked. And, and finally, I want to give a shout out 
um, to the uh, members from uh, the National Child Welfare Workforce Institute who are also attending today. A lot of the um, uh, material that you're gonna hear today uh, from me uh, was developed in uh, partnership with my amazing colleagues uh, who are also uh, affiliated with that particular program. So I just wanna give them a shout out as well. So we wanted to start the conversation just talking a little bit about the history of this policy field. Uh, Rebecca, can you show the one slide? Um, partially because we knew that because the Evans School called this conversation, there was gonna be a variety of people who knew anything about this policy area. Um, actually, can you go back one slide? There's a problem with not controlling it, yeah. Um, and so, Alan kind of suggested in his comments, and John did as well, that there have been lots of attempts to influence this child welfare system from policy. And these are just some of the highlights over time. And, um, but there's a history that, that starts before this, particularly when we're talking about the way that the state interacts with children of color. And so Tessa is expert uh, in what's the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, but she is also expert in what happened before. So I wanted to start with some kind of comments about the origins of the system. Uh, how did, how did we, where did we start even before this kind of policy was trying to reform it? So do we have the slide to show? There we go. Hi, everybody. So I'm just going to spend a couple minutes to give you a historical context for Indian child welfare policy. And it'll give you a sense of the underlying assumptions inherent in policies impacting Native children and families for many, many, many years and generations. Um, I would say that historically, policies directed at Native children have been one of the most powerful and insidious tools used to undermine tribal communities and undermine tribal sovereignty. And really, if you look at the early policy efforts impacting Native children, they focus primarily on assimilation, um, first through education. Um, early in public education in the United States, uh, there was not an inclusion of Native children, at least formally. But the federal government had long used Western education as an acculturation tool, which was sometimes directed at Native communities. The expansion of assimilationist education began in 1819 with the passage of the Indian Civilization Act. And this act appropriated funding um, to private organizations in the beginning that then developed Indian boarding schools. And many of you have heard about Indian boarding schools. If you haven't, you'll be hearing more, I think, with some of the things that are coming down, um, uncovering some of the abuses of the schools. Um, but they, they developed these schools with the overt mission of assimilation. It was clearly stated in their mission. It was not hidden at all. Um, during this time, many Native children were forcibly removed from their homes and communities and they were sent to schools hundreds and sometimes even thousands of miles away. And they were allowed only limited contact with their families and communities. And they were forced to learn Western ways and speak English. And they were often punished if they practiced their cultural traditions or um, spoke their language. And obviously this was incredibly devastating to uh, tribal families and the children um, and to their entire communities. And it really undermined a, tribe's, a tribal community's rights and responsibilities to raise their own children, right? The school leaders claimed great success um, and they had a lot of public support among non-natives at this time. By 1900, Indian education funds exceeded 3 million a year and there were 153 Indian boarding schools operating across the country. And by the 1920s, nearly half of all native children were enrolled in a boarding or industrial school. And many of them have been forcibly taken from their communities, as I said, and parents could even be arrested for interfering with that removal. Um, so it was really a devastating um, period. And it was profoundly traumatic, obviously sending a clear message to tribal communities. The government wanted to assimilate Native children um, and that, that communities were stripped away of their right to raise their children. It left an enormous legacy of pain and trauma that continues today, obviously. In the early 20th century, public opinion began to shift a bit, and there was increasing concern about the health and welfare of tribal communities and policies impacting tribes. 
the Secretary of the Interior ordered a full evaluation of the situation, which resulted in the Miriam Report in 1928. And this report really presented the health and welfare conditions in tribal communities, which were dire at the time, and gave an overview of conditions in Indian boarding schools. Um, so the findings had a significant impact on thinking around policy impacting tribal communities, including boarding schools. And the government began to close many of the schools or reform them at least and agencies serving tribal communities began to move towards humanitarian relief instead of education. Um, during this time, Congress also passed the Johnson O'Malley Act, which many of you probably have heard of, which authorized the Secretary of the Interior to contract with states and private agencies to provide health, education, and social, social services to tribal communities. The explicit intent was to support the growth of healthy tribal communities and economies, but the act also gave great authority for Indian child welfare to states and governmental agencies, which again diminished tribal rights to their children, right? By the mid 20th century, federal agencies were providing more and more child welfare services to tribal children. And soon the state was overseeing the majority of child welfare cases. Um, and though not generally overtly assimilationist, child welfare work was predicated clearly on the assumption that assimilation was in the best interest of Native children. And you can see this in historical case notes of child welfare workers. It was evident in things like the Indian Adoption Project, um, which promoted the adoptions of Native children into mainly white homes in the 1950s. Um, and this was a time when other children were generally placed with families of their same racial and ethnic background. Um, and removals of na from Native homes escalated dramatically throughout the 20th century. Um, and thousands and thousands of Native children were removed from their homes each year in their communities and placed in foster care and adoptive homes, the vast majority of which were white. Um, by the 1960s, this crisis had reached epidemic proportions and tribal leaders and their allies were desperately advocating for dramatic change. I mean, it was clear to them the situation, um, but they were trying to get public acknowledgement of it. Um, the tribes requested assistance from the Association on American Indian Affairs and um, uh, a federally funded large scale study of child welfare conditions in native communities was conducted and the results were staggering. And if you wanna put up the next slide, we'll see some of the results. Um, they were staggering and profoundly just just really, really awful. But they helped also propel a pivotal moment for Indian child welfare because this data provided clear and really profound evidence of the situation. For example, researchers found in the states with the largest native populations that between 25% and 35% of all native children in those states had been removed from their homes. If you think about that, think about a community losing a quarter to over a third of the children in that community had been removed. It's just devastating, right? And to make matters worse, nearly all of these children had been removed from their homes based on a finding of neglect. And that's a much more subjective determination than child abuse, as many of you know. Um, and these cases were determined mostly by non-native social workers and the children were mostly placed in non-native, mostly white homes. So these study results really highlighted the enormity of the problem and politicians, policymakers, child welfare agencies and workers could no longer ignore the situation and continue with business as usual. And the public began to find out about the, these results. And in fact, they were actually reported in Europe before the United States. So it, was, it became sort of a, a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, tribal leaders demanded more control over the rights of their own children and began vigorously advocating for federal policy to support this mission. And as a result in 1978, uh, the creation of the passage of ICWA, uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act happened. So um, we'll talk more about that, but that's sort of the background for you. And this um, unique history to indigenous children is one thing. There's also a parallel history uh, for African-American children Alan, I think you were going to help kind of ground us in that reality. Yeah, thanks, Jody, and thanks, Tessa. I think when we think about um, the experiences of Black children and families in this system, I think it's important to start by acknowledging that the history of separating Black children from their parents in the United States began over 400 years ago during human chattel slavery where black children were separated from their families routinely as a means of maintaining dominance and control over enslaved people. 
after the abolition of slavery, what we saw is the emergence of the, the child welfare system or a child welfare system that, as is the case of most government systems that emerged after slavery, after abolition of slavery, emerged as a means of maintaining that white supremacy that was now threatened by abolition of slavery. And what we saw in the case of the child welfare system is this began largely through what's called the orphan train movement. The orphan train movement began by a man named Charles Loring Brace, who in New York City became very concerned about the population of homeless street children living in New York City that were engaging in petty theft and deemed largely as nuisances um, by the community. He developed a program where those children were moved from the streets of New York City to host families in the rural Midwest, which was a rapidly expanding area of the country, placed with those homes where they were both used for labor, but also raised as family members. And in the mid to, from the mid 1800s to early 1900s, the orphan trains resettled over 200,000 children from the East Coast to the rural Midwest. What's often not mentioned about the orphan trains is that the orphan trains actually resettled over 200,000 white children from New York City to the rural Midwest. Black children were intentionally excluded from that system. Um, although they were eligible for those services, they were intentionally excluded. Moving into then the 1930s and 40s, what we saw then is the orphan train project ended, the modern day child welfare system began as a mean, as a program largely meant to assist families living in poverty. Um, over time, through the Aid for Dependent Children, which was passed by the Social Security Act, over time, as more and more Black families became eligible to pover for poverty relief services, we saw that punitive laws and policies were established to expel or deny Black families from accessing those services through what were called unsuitability clauses or men in the home clauses. Um, and during the 1960s, tens of thousands of Black children were either expelled from welfare roles or denied access to aid for dependent children. That led to the development of what that kind of outrage of that led to the development of what is often what is the Fleming rule, which was named after the head of DHHS at the time, which um, no longer allowed exclusion from welfare because of these unsuitability clauses, but also provided that families who had been removed from welfare roles had to be investigated to determine if they were unsafe. So what we saw is that tens of thousands of Black children and families who were removed from welfare roles were then subsequently investigated by what was largely a white child welfare workforce that then placed those children in foster care because of, they were deemed unsafe, which led to what we now call disproport racial disproportionality, which I know we'll talk about later. And then over the years, we saw the development of policies like mandatory reporting laws, as the as more and more black children and families entered the system, we saw the system shift from one that was based largely on poverty relief to one that became more of a system of surveillance, regulation, and punishment, which is where we are today. That's a lot. What you both said is a lot, right? It's heartbreaking. And um, it's the origins of the child welfare system. Um, I want to want to now pivot a little bit to what is the current system, right? So this is the foundation upon which something was built, um, but some things have changed as um, as society has evolved. Tessa, do you want to go on this, or Angelique, do you want to start? Um, if you, I'm happy to start. If you could throw the slides back up, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So as I talk about some of our current policies that we um, uh, are now uh, governed by in terms of our child welfare system, I want to talk about first just defining these four pillars and that you'll be able to see throughout our discussion of current child welfare uh, legislation, how these different aspects have been emphasized and de-emphasized uh, throughout our legislative making process. And then we're gonna talk about what are the consequences of making those choices in terms of emphasizing and de-emphasizing over time. So these four um, competing and overlapping perspectives include um, expedient permanency, 
cultural continuity, family preservation, and social ad advantage. Each of these perspectives strive to improve child well being. Expedient permanency prioritizes stability by aiming to quickly find a permanent family for a child. Cultural continuity prioritizes connection to a child's identity and culture. Family preservation prioritizes biological connections with a child's family. And social advantage prioritizes long-term self-sufficiency by presenting connections uh, that might eventually lead to um, employment, uh, which in terms increases financial stability of our families um, and addresses many poverty-related issues that tend to bring our children into the child welfare system in the first place. Each of and these really? four, oh, oh yes, go ahead. Go, uh, go ahead. I just, I want to give John a heads up because John, I want to ask how you see these themes showing up in your practice and in your work for the last 20 years. But Angelique, I'm sorry, I thought you were finished with this slide. Yeah. So I uh, just wanted to add one last thing in that each of these perspectives, I believe, is an important aspect of child well being. But implementing child welfare legislation that adequately addresses all four of these perspectives has historically been a challenge. And we'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that after um, John provides his comment. So John, I'm just wondering, these are kind of big picture concepts, but on the front lines and in the supervisory roles you've played, you kind of see them all intertwined, I imagine. So I just was wondering if you had any reflections on this. Um. Well, I mean, I think that's that's an act that's certainly an accurate um, characterization of of how the system is is attempting or or um, aspiring to work at this point. Uh, what what continues to happen though is that I don't think that that those are are um, responses to a problem, but not um, solutions to the problem. I mean, we, we, you know, we're, we're sort of recognizing that, that the system is broken and it's not working the way we would hope that it works. And so we come up with these ideas and I'm not criticizing the, the, the notions you know, involved in those pillars, um, but we're, we're really not dealing with the underlying issues. And so no matter how hard we, we try, we, we don't quite get to the place where we can say that, that the system writ large is um, truly responsive to the needs of families. Um, it, you can have these pockets. I think in, in, um, in Olmstead, our practice has been very person-centered, very family-oriented, um, and very much understanding that there is harm that we can that, that we can we can um, we can create harm to families just in just in doing sort of our daily our daily work and so we really strive very strongly not to involve the system as deeply as as it might be uh, as often as we as we can but even having said that we're we're still um, we're still subject to, I think, some larger forces and factors at play. I mean, it's been my contention for a long time that um, that disproportionality is is really a, a, uh, an example, or um, well, it's it's an illustration of a system of. <clears throat> um, a disease pro it's a it's a it, that there is an underlying disease process um and the 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 numbers that we see that tell us that there is disproportionality are simply indicators that there are th that there is this disease process because it's not it's not uh it's not confined to child welfare i mean i think that's the other thing that we have to that's the terrifying in a lot of ways is that we can talk all we want about how we'd like our child welfare system to work, but it's in the context of a broader system where disproportionality exists on so many levels. And in every, actually for, for African-Americans, descendants of slaves and uh, um, indigenous people, it's, they're always at the bottom of the social, of social measures. And that tells me that it's not just a child welfare issue. 
um, because it's not, and it's not just, it's not just poverty. Because even when we control for poverty, we find that, it, it, like in home ownership, for example, that if you control for income, you still find disproportionate, uh, negative disproportionate representation of, of African Americans and Native Americans. So anyway, so I'm just saying, and I think we need to we need to think broadly about it. Um, and, and and this, I think, is what's what I've witnessed you as you've been my mentor. Like, how do you work within that larger context with intentionality, right? And then there are these policies um, that have passed over time, and Angelique's going to talk about them in a second. That um, are trying to work and adjust. So. Angelique, can you tell us a little bit more about that policy arc and what, kind of what is right now in relation to it? I think you're going to see as I talk about the, the different uh, pieces of legislation on the next slide that you'll see pendulum switch, uh, shifts that have occurred um, you know, throughout our, our um, child welfare policy history you know, that has been implemented over the last 40 years and that these different pillars have been emphasized and de-emphasized, which has led to uh, consequences, uh, consequences, conscious or unconscious, um, that have had uh, negative um, uh, implications on our most vulnerable children and families. And I know there's uh, uh, my colleagues who are speaking with me, you know, uh, discuss that that many of these policies and John, as you articulated, you know, uh, are not uh, necessarily unintentional. And there's been some incredible intentional decision-making that has happened that has had a uh, huge um, negative repercussions uh, on our uh, BIPOC families in particular. Do you um, wanna share mm -hmm. kind of the current data? Uh, sure, we can go to the next slide and we'll come back to this one. So um, I want to, you know, give a shout out to my colleagues at NICWI and to Asia Schomburg, who gave permission uh, for this slide to be used to give you some idea of how our trends in terms of, of who's entering um, and leaving the foster care system. And despite the changes in policy that we've had over time, we've seen uh, stagnation uh, in terms of, of our numbers and who is being impacted. So as you can see uh, on, the, on the data on these slides, uh, that a lot of these different policies that have been made over time have done little to address the overrepresentation of our BIPOC families in the child welfare system. Um, so we've really moved the needle little on foster care entry and exits over time. Um, so uh, what we're arguing for is, is to really go back to the pillars and John would argue even broader than the pillars that we've showed in order to really address this because of current um, decisions have not moved the needle. So you'll see uh, in this first picture here on entering and, ex uh, and exiting that, um, you know, uh, really our numbers have really been just a straight line. We haven't really seen a lot of change. And this, I think this final table on the bottom really is stark showing, you know, the rate of children entering care by race. And you'll see that our American Indian Alaskan Native kids are the most overrepresented in the U.S. child welfare system, uh, you know, followed by our uh, Black children. And then finally, a, um, a particular population that we haven't given a lot of voice Two is our native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population to understand the pretty huge representation that they have in our child welfare system uh, as a whole. And then our young people who are of two or, or more races is also a very notable um, uh, issue and concern. And um, uh, uh, we could do a whole talk, a whole nother talk on the implications of, you know, of transracial adoption and how that looks and that struggle with identity development in the in the huge again ramifications when we don't when we're not attuned to the to the needs of our young people. One of the things that I think from a policy perspective is interesting, right, is given the overrepresentation of American Indian and Native Hawaiian kids is the role of, of the law, the Indian Child Welfare Act. And Tess, I'm wondering if you could turn uh, to sharing a bit of of about that with the with the group? Sure, and I think there's a slide there too, if you find it. But um, 
the Indian Child Welfare Act um, was, was developed right after the history that I talked about, the creation and passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act was in 1978, and it was um, implemented the following May, actually. And it's a landmark legislation, and it changed not only how federal and state agencies treat Native families, but also acknowledges the nation-to-nation -nation relationship between tribes and the government. And it's really based on sovereignty. And what it does is it um, it addresses, or at least you know, tries to address remedy the high removals that we were seeing, and um, and it has strict requirements in Indian child welfare cases. It defers authority for Native children to the tribes in many cases, and it's really premised on the belief that protecting the cultural identity of Native children is fundamental to their well-being, and not only their well-being, but the tribe's well-being. That's an important thing to think about. Um, and tribes have exclusive jurisdiction over children who live on reservations, except in uh, just a few cases, and they can ask for jurisdiction at any point. Um, it gives higher standards of proof uh, in terms of uh, Indian child welfare custody proceedings, and there's a preference for placement with family members and tribal members or other native um, families. Uh, it's really the goal is family and cultural preservation, as I said, and it's, and it's based on um, tribal sovereignty. It's led to a number of positive changes for sure. It's landmark. Uh, it, there's an increase in tribal and other child welfare programs. There's been more thorough training. Um, it's actually a, a really nice model for, um, for working with all families in the system. Um, there's been the formation of a number of new state tribal agreements that support uh, working towards best care for Native children. But um, despite all that, it's really never been fully uh, implemented and it's uh, been underfunded and there are always challenges to ICWA. Um, so, and those continue and it's really, uh, it, it's really hard to see, but it, you know, there are constant challenges to it and people trying to take it down or break it down. Um, but, you know, it is one, it's, it's, I think, just really a blueprint for some of the things that can be, be better in the system, though it continues to weather attacks. Can you say more about the blueprint or the gold standard? What, what, what about this law is significant in your mind? Well, I think um, actually, and, and Angelique might want to take this one. I think the gold standard is really, um, for in terms of tribes' sovereignty and the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, and having tribes have control over their citizens and you know authority over what happens to children. Um, but it's also the higher standards for um, looking at um, cases and families, and the the really the the focus on family preservation and keeping children with their communities. So it's you know, pretty basic, but I think that for me is the gold standard of it. But um, Angelique may have a lot more to say about that. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of things that we can pick out of the Indian Child Welfare Act that have, uh, that have actually demonstrated a role model for the rest of the child welfare world, what actually works. So I wanna take some time just to call out what those components are and to, to help people understand that we actually have made uh, federal policy making choices that have actually taken the lessons from ICWA uh, and apply them to all children. However, we've done a really terrible job acknowledging that these lessons learned have actually come from the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, so I just wanna call that out and then um, help walk you through what some of these really wonderful, powerful lessons have been in terms of, of the ICWA. You know, first uh, it is the first um, national legislation recognizing a preference for preserving families by placing children with relatives. So this concept of kinship care was born out of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And I know that all of the child welfare experts, you know, on the call today can, can acknowledge that they have been working aggressively in their public child welfare systems on uh, creating policies and practices that center relative placement as the first placement choice. And so just calling out and acknowledging that the ICWA really brought that lesson to bear that we've now pulled and have applied much largely uh, in the um, child welfare system. For example, uh, Title IV-E mandates that states applying for federal funds must give preference to adult relatives as caregivers over non-related caregivers when determining a child placement, uh, provided that relatives can meet state protection standards. Um, 
we have 26 of our states require travel for agencies to exercise due diligence, which requires states to find kin for children. Many states use family finding as the practice to do that. Um, it's also important to understand, again, um, looking at ICWA as the lesson learned that tribal communities have always used broader definitions in the identification of who kin are. And we are now, as a public child welfare system, also acknowledging the expansion of the term of who um, uh, constitutes the definition of a kinship caregiver and um, uh, uh, the broader uh, society is looking at fictive kin uh, in addition to a blood related kin in terms of a, a viable um, kin placement option as an example. Can you just, Ooh, for yes. those of us not tracking the details here, can you just say more about this term fictive kin? Um, yeah, so, so fictive kin uh, is defined as close family friends uh, or people that, that children have had a relationship with um, who are they are not blood related to. So it's trying to leverage more of the natural community supports that are available for kids. Mm -hmm. Tessa, one of the questions in the chat was, uh, you had said that ICWA isn't fully implemented. Can you just say more uh, for, for the audience about what you meant about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it just in, in a few examples, it, it has not been fully funded. And so a number of tribes don't have the resources that they would really need to fully implement it. That's just one thing. Um, it, and it, though there's training um, for child welfare workers, the training has been limited in some areas um, so that you, know, you get kids in the system that aren't identified as native until I've seen it even at the points of adoption. You know, And so um, that, that even though people try to implement it, the training isn't there necessarily. Um, I would say the underfunding is a huge issue actually. So, um, and Angelique might have other ideas too, but um, I think if we were, if the vision of it was that, mm -hmm. that the tribes would have more resources to really implement it and would be more in, more tribal courts, more tribal child welfare workers mm -hmm. um, and, the, and we need resources to do that. Yeah, and, and when we get to the solution slide, Jody, we'll, we have some concrete examples of what that could look like. Yep, there's a couple of other chat uh, chat questions here and I, I wanna um, see what either of you say about this. They're talking about the fact that there's been legis uh, lawsuits, right? That are both trying to push for more adherence to ICWA and uh, I guess, uh, the Washington State Attorney General is um, has the fourth attempt, it says in the comment, to weaken the law, um, according to this this commenter. So I'm just curious about if if there are ways to talk about any trends you see around either using the legal system to bolster or uh, undermine or or minimize um, the ICWA legislation. The Indian Child Welfare Act has been attacked by the courts several times throughout history uh, and, and cross our fingers, ICWA has come out on top. Um, there have been many, many strategies and I'm, I'm gonna call out uh, Heather Zanoni who's on this call today who helped draft uh, in partnership uh, with um, Congresswoman Bass, the, um, the 40th anniversary recognition of the Indian Child Welfare Act where, where there was huge bipartisan support in terms of signing on to that piece of legislation. Um, and, you know, obviously the Indian Child Welfare Act is under attack now uh, under uh, this uh, Fifth Circuit uh, Texas uh, holding. Uh, but the, one of the other things that I wanna call out that many states could be working on to overcome uh, some of these concerns is to work towards creating state level legislation. There are several states, 10 in all right now that have state um, specific codification of the Indian Child Welfare Act into their laws. And, and remember, you know, um, regardless of what's happening in the, the federal courts around ICWA, states who choose to adopt the ICWA and implement at the state level can choose to continue to support this under their state law, regardless of what happens at the federal level. So, you know, so, so I plead with everyone on this call, if you're from a state who has not codified ICWA into your state statutes to please consider that. That is one absolute thing you can do right now without 
uh, knowing or understanding, you know, what the what these federal court um, uh, decisions are happening, that you can overcome that through your uh, state statutory uh, efforts. So, uh, you know, consider this an official call of action. And um, one of the representatives on the meeting just asked, and he chatted me thinking it was trying to hold, but is that then to have state law mirror federal law and then work to implement it fully at the state? And I, is that I'd, I'd love to challenge states even further. So for example, you know, there's so many Michiganders on the call, so I'm just gonna give you all a, a shout out, you know, that in places, both Michigan and Washington uh, state statutes, in addition to following the federal standards for ICWA, have chosen to actually increase the eligibility of young people who can be served under this statute, which includes members of state historic tribes and Canadian First Nations children. So uh, for, for the folks on the call that are um, thinking or are um, inspired to do this work in your states, that I'd encouraging you, you know, you can, um, you, you have that flexibility at the state law to expand this to cover more children in your states. And I, and I hope you choose to do so. Oh, thanks so, for clarifying, Tara. It's, yeah, Michigan has the um, Canadian First Nations kids covered in their statute. So we've been now spending uh, a number of minutes on the Indian Child Welfare Law. And we're starting to get kind of into the technical pieces of that. Alan, how do you interpret this conversation? Like, what's your reaction to this kind of work? Yeah, I, th I think what this kind of works makes me think of is, is the limits of reform efforts in the sense that we've known that Black children, Indigenous children have been disproportionately overrepresented in the system for decades. This is not a new problem to the child welfare system. And the child welfare system has been unable to substantively address that problem. And I think that's because reforms always focus on the edges of the problem while obscuring, obscuring the actual harm that's caused by child welfare intervention. If you think about current reform efforts, reforms are and the system is designed right now to achieve racial equity. And on the surface, a goal of racial equity for both Black children and Indigenous children makes sense. If disproportionate overrepresentation is the problem, then racial equity or proportionate representation is the solution. But that obscures the reality that this system is not a benevolent helping system. It obscures the reality of the harm that child welfare intervention, family separation causes to children and families. So, Disproportionate overrepresentation isn't the problem. The problem is the racist abuse inflicted by the child welfare system on Black and Indigenous children and families. Think about the outcomes of family separation and foster care. Children who experience family separation and foster care are more likely to experience homelessness, poverty, joblessness, substance use, death by suicide, a host of poor outcomes. So the system itself is creating the conditions of oppression that maintain the oppression of Black and Indigenous families in this country through their interventions. So reforms that are centered around a goal of racial equity, all that means is that the fundamental harm of family separation remains. Hundreds of thousands of children are still separated from their parents. They're just proportioned equitably by race. So goals of racial equity, these reforms that never address the fundamental harm of family separation can't be the solution because they never address the underlying problem. So when I was doing my background to prepare for this, one of the things I think that's related to what you've just said, Alan, is that the research really aligns with what John had said, which is that poverty is a really important factor driving what's going on that we see in that so social scientists you know control for things um, and the, and they basically say that the socioeconomic factors right are what's driving things here but that's a little bit different explanation than what we've kind of set up here which is around the kind of institutionalized racism that's in the system so I'm curious Alan or John if you have any reaction to that kind of argument because 
there's something nuanced here that I can't quite put my finger on around the role of poverty and how it interacts with race. And because as John says, on the front lines, it's a big, big kind of mass <laughs> where these things aren't easy to separate out, right? Yeah, I don't necessarily make the, I mean, I wouldn't make the con direct connection between poverty and disproportionality. I mean, that, that happens certainly, and there's a connect, there's a relationship, but it's not a, I don't see it as a causal relationship. The, and, and the solution to me, I mean, it's like, Alan, when you talk about, I know you're not, you're not promoting this, but when you talk about sort of equalizing the pain, that to me is not a solution. I mean, that's, that's part of the problem is that when we start talking about disproportionality, the tendency is, you know, is, is to get sort of mesmerized by the numbers. And we start thinking, oh, you know, we're doing too much over here, so let's do less of that or do more of this over here. And so, it, so that it appears as though things are equal. And that's really not what we're, not, we're, not where we wanna go. I mean, um, we, can do, we can do less. I mean, and, and, and I think we've proved that in, in Olmstead, we've done less placement of, of kids in general. I mean, it's possible to do that. It's possible to get that number down. But have we really changed the underlying or impacted the underlying process? And for, to me, what, what needs to happen is that we can't, we, we need to understand, when we start talking about equity, we can't just sort of think in terms of the people who are negatively impacted. We have to think about the people who are doing the harm. I mean, they need to change, something needs to change in their thinking. Um, and they need to understand that the policies and practice, practices that are happening are having this either intended or unintended consequence and outcomes for people who, for, for people who are living on the margins. So that the changes that we need to make need to be made sort of in the consciousness of those people who are making policy. And also we need to change the practices that were, that are being utilized by the different organizations that are doing this. And we need to change the, the thinking of people at down the, the line level who are actually doing the work. I mean, everybody needs to have a role in changing the outcomes. It can't just be, it can't just be a, symptom, a, a systematic change. I mean, we need, we need people change. And I think one of the ways we do that is we give some much more weight to the people being impacted, the people being harmed. And we create mechanisms to get their voice actively engaged in policy making and practice making. And I'm I would, gonna come back. I, yeah, go ahead. No. I just wanted to briefly add, you know, I think you know, poverty is absolutely a contributor to involvement in the child welfare system, but it's important to acknowledge that the reason uh, Black families, Indigenous families are more likely to experience poverty is because of centuries of racism mm -hmm. in this country. So it's not a racism or poverty issue. Mm -hmm. Poverty and the overrepresentation of Black families, Indigenous families in the United States is because of centuries of racism and racist policies that have led to them being overrepresented in poverty. Right, yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't saying that it wasn't, I'm saying it's, it is absolutely related. And I think you're absolutely right that it is that underlying racist oppressive um, history that we've, we've lived through that's led to this. Um, but I, but I, what I'm saying is I don't think that you can well, anyway, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> um, it is that, that underlying disease process that's leading to these negative outcomes. Poverty happens to be mixed in there. But as I said, in, in some cases, it's not about, only about poverty. I mean, when you control for income, you see negative outcomes for, for people of color in other, um, on other social measures. So it's not just about poverty, it's about racism. In the chat, there's a lot of uh, questions about when Alan was talking about the system, right? And John is talking about 
his efforts working in the system over time. And I guess I'm curious about any of you, um, first of all, when you think about the state systems of removal and placement into foster care that in some places are done by county governments. You know, some people on the chat are saying that there's, you know, entrenched bureaucratic forms that, you know, make it so that the system is the problem. And other people are writing a little bit about trying to encourage the discretion of people who are working in that system so that they can adjust to families. And how do you all think about, um, you know, today, given what we have now, the kind of resources that we have or don't have? in the formal apparatus. And I think I know what Alan would say, but I'm curious what other people would say. Um, if we have to try to make change with the infrastructure we got um, at this point, like what's your assessment of the practice realities of this field? Well, one thing, and just going to put this out there, I think it's a simple concept, but I think, you know, the workers and the policymakers need to understand when you remove a child from their family, from their community, you are creating a situation that's of multi-generational impact, that you are not just impacting that family and that community in the now, but that child will go on with a legacy of loss, that family will go on, the cultural connections may be broken, or they may be you know, they may, it may be hard to repair them later, right? So I think that's part of what I love about ICWA actually is that it acknowledges that this, the harm is, is extends for generations and generations. And I just wish our training in child welfare would acknowledge that. It's a simple thing, but I, I think that's an important piece of it. Do people think that the system is calcified? Somebody said recalcified, calcified and recalcitrant in the way that people work in the system. I think there's some element of that, but I, but I think I'm more hopeful. I mean, I think then thinking that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's done, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's dead and dying. Um, just around the issue of disproportionality, for example, um, one of the things I've been doing over the years is trying to educate um, line workers on the issue of disproportionality. And what's surprising to me is a lot of them have no clue. I mean, when I show them the data, it's like, oh, wow, you know, we didn't know this was going on. And so that's what I'm saying. There was a change. There, there's... I think there is there is room for and hope for change in some of the mindsets. It's like when you put it out there for people, and it, particularly at the line level, and say, "Look, this is what's going on. Um, this is how it's working for these groups of people," um, and then you can get into deeper discussions about the generational consequences and outcomes of of those practices. I think that's where you can start to, to, at that level, start to encourage and, and implement some, some changes. I mean, that's not sufficient, obviously, but, but I, I was surprised the first time I ever did a presentation for staff around that. Like, it seemed so obvious to me. And then when I presented it, it was like, oh, we never knew that. And I think that's, that, I mean, that's part of, that's part of being that's part of privilege, you know, it's like you don't have to think about it if it's not affecting people that you know and care about. Um, and if the system is sort of blind to those impacts, as I think many parts of our system are, um, they don't ever think about it, in those, think about the work, the work that we're doing, they don't think about it in those terms. I'm going to turn in just a second to kind of the future and the, the changes that you would each advocate. But there's one other question that's very specific um, about ideas for recruiting foster families from BIPAC communities. And, you know, what are the barriers that get in the way from having kinship networks step forward um, in situations uh, where, where the child needs to not be with their parents?
Anybody want to say anything about that? Jody, can you um, ask your question again? I think there's so much going on in the chat that it is impossible to follow both at the same time. <laughs> Multitasking. Um, one <laughs> of the comments that was, the questions that was asked was really about how do you recruit foster families from BIPOC communities? And what are the barriers that you think are facing people um, from, from stepping up as kin when children are not able to stay with their families? Like just very practically, um, if we have one of those pillars that Angelique talked about at the beginning is keeping cultural continuity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of barriers. For one, uh, uh, our state agencies don't really spend a whole lot of time you know, uh, in our neighborhoods, you know, that are majority, um, you know, BIPOC families, you know, as a whole, you know, uh, public travel for agencies wait for people to knock on their door versus going out and knocking on the doors of the community. So uh, we need to spend some time going to the communities and helping them understand how valuable they are because they're disenfranchised. They don't, they don't see themselves as the, as the answer unless we invite them to be part of the answer. So we have to, you know, have an open invitation. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, being intentional in terms of, uh, of recruitment strategies is part of it. The other part is that our BIPOC families, uh, you know, encounter barriers, uh, you know, in the uh, licensing process that impedes their abilities to come forward. And that's not unlike what you see from our stories of our kinship caregivers. Um, we know um, one of the biggest strengths in diversifying uh, who our caregivers are is to prioritize kin uh, because of um, the vast majority of our kinship caregivers who are um, uh, taking care of our children in the formal travel for system are members of the BIPOC community. So, um, so if we are intentional uh, in terms of making modifications to our licensing standards, that when we work, rec recruit kin in those roles, we are in fact addressing that problem at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I wanna I turn it, now, oh, go ahead, John. No, I think in line with that, um, that recruitment process, it also, um, may require and often does require us to provide a bit more supports for those families mm -hmm. um, as well as as lifting some of the um, eligibility criteria and I don't mean that in in you know that we're suddenly lowering the bar but there are some criteria that um, that might eliminate someone from from uh, being accepted as a as a kinship provider that really isn't significantly or substantively um, important. And, and so we need to have that kind of sensitivity, I think, in those eligibility questions mm -hmm. and decisions. Mm -hmm. I, I would also add um, that, I, well, first of all, I think a lot of our tribal communities, a lot, a lot of people are stepping up and helping and, and taking care of grandchildren and you know, aunties and uncles are there for people. Um, and I think it's, really threatening to think about getting yourself, your family involved in the child welfare system. I mean, even somebody with my privilege and resources, I would think it's like, okay, so then I'm going to have extra eyes on, you know, the kids that are already living in my home or, you know what I'm, or my friends or so, you know, if somebody like me with my power and privilege and the, you know, in the system is thinking that, you know, I can imagine that others have just the mistrust must be so huge. So mm -hmm. I would just add mm -hmm. that too. Mm -hmm. Part of calling my motivation to call this conversation at a public policy school was to think as we're doing here about the intersection between practice and policy. And each of you, I think are doing work to try and move forward solutions, you know, from Alan's idea about abolishing to some of the advocacy and legislation that Angelique's working on to the Pathways to Prosperity, that program that John is working on. And so this has been kind of an intense, heavy session so far, people, um, you know, tough legacy, really tough issues, tough current reality. 
I'd like to kind of pivot us now to thinking about these solutions. And so wonder, Alan, if you could say more about um, the abolish work and the up end movement and what does that really look like? Like it, it's kind of enticing, but it's terrifying to me to think about. So say more about what that would be. Yeah. So abolition builds on, on the idea that I mentioned that reforms just aren't, aren't enough to address the underlying harm that the system causes. And it's because those reforms never address the fundamental problem of family separation and the harm that results from that. Reforms have made the system a little bit friendlier, maybe a little bit less harmful, but never address, but family separations continue, termination of parental rights continues. Um, Derricka Purnell, who's a brilliant abolitionist writer, recently wrote a piece for Colin Kaepernick's new publishing company called Reforms Are the Master's Tools, building off of Audre Lorde's idea that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I think that's what reforms do. They, they look good. They look appealing to people. It sounds like they're doing something substantive, but they never address the underlying harm. Think of like a recent example that I'm sure you all are familiar with, not in the child welfare system. When there was a large population of Haitian people migrating to the United States, we all saw on TV, border patrol agents on horses whipping those people who are trying to enter the United States. As a response to that, the Biden administration expressed their outrage and announced that horses would no longer be used by border patrol agents. The horses weren't the problem. The horses were never the problem, but that's what reform does. It looks nice around the edges. It prevents this public statement that they're doing something, but the harm, the racism, the oppression continues. So abolition is about the complete elimination of the system not tomorrow, but gradually over time, reducing the reliance on removal, reducing the use of removal as an intervention and identifying ways to shift resources away from the billions of dollars that maintain a system of foster care to families and communities that need it. If you think about it, this is kind of a simplistic example. Right now, what we have is a system that removes children primarily because of poverty related issues that we've talked about. Only 17% of children in foster care are in care because of physical or sexual abuse. So what we have is a system that removes children from their families because of poverty, then places those children in the home of strangers to take care of them, and then pays those strangers money to take care of someone else's children when all those children's families need is money. Here in Texas, we give foster parents a minimum of $900 a month to take care of someone else's child. What if we just gave that $900 a month to the mother who's struggling to meet her child's needs? We could get to a place in society where we're not just ending the child welfare system, we're making the need for the child welfare system obsolete. That's what absolute abolition is about. So you said not immediately, if the world was run by you, where would you start? What would be the first next thing? I would say the first next thing would be eliminating mandatory reporting laws, eliminating removals that are based on poverty and subsequent simultaneously passing legislative efforts that provide things like universal basic income, child allowances. So, John, no, let me go to Angelique first. So Angelique is thinking about change in a different way than Alan. She's thinking about policy change at the national level. Do you want to share what kind of your solution set is? And I think we should pull up the slides here. Sure, right? sure. That would be great. So if you could start with the slide that's labeled, what is active efforts? Ooh. So just pointing out again, um, just uh, talking about uh, best practices from the Indian Child Welfare Act. This is the another piece of Indian Child Welfare uh, Act that actually none of the states are doing. There's been some conversations about it, but we have not um, actually used this lesson as something that can be applied more broadly in the child welfare system. So this idea that you know. Um, 
uh, of active efforts, which has been clearly defined uh, in federal statute, and to remind us that the um, our standard of practice that we uh, apply to all children in care, actually, um, we have we don't have good federal guidance on. So we're kind of rolling this child welfare system out without clear guidance. So for example, this reasonable um, effort standard, we have no national definition for it. States um, all have different ways on how they define it and apply it. Um, so, so, you know, um, there really isn't good direction on that. And we shouldn't be surprised that we're struggling when we can't agree on what the practice should be. So we've all agreed federally what active efforts are. So let's apply active efforts to all children since we can't agree on what reasonable efforts is. So that's one policy change. So next slide. Um, and then uh, just understanding when Tessa was uh, making remarks in her presentation that there are some practices that are occurring that are, despite we know the strength of ICWA, that there has been some things that have undermined it. So we want to shore up ICWA so that it can really be maximized to its fullest potential. Um, so for example, um, uh, not all states or not all tribes rather have been given their uh, opportunity to fully exercise their sovereign authority in terms of implementing the Indian Child Welfare Act. So we need to provide supports that give uh, tribes the ability to actually do what their federal right uh, to exercise um, sovereignty is. Only 17 tribes across the US have uh, currently have access to direct federal uh, Title IV-E dollars. Uh, the rest of our, our tribes um, are really uh, reliant on tribal state partnerships to be able to do that. And, and obviously, again, we have no federal guidance on what a tribal state partnership is or should look like or what tribal consultation in applying ICWA is at the state level. So uh, that is another huge gap. Um, in addition to $40, um, we have more than 500 tribal nations across the country. Only 150 tribes have access to Title IV-B direct dollars, which is such a tiny pot of dollars uh, that we need to uh, provide tribes the ability to actually implement their tribal travel for systems the way that they hope and want and desire to do. So uh, one of our call to actions is to increase Title IV-B grants for tribes that would actually help them build the capacity to meet the needs of their tribal children and families. And we actually do have a piece of legislation, thanks to Karen Bass, that would allow us to do just that. So I have the, um, the outline of that particular policy on the next slide. I'm not gonna go through it all because you will have access to these slides after that, um, that guides and helps you truly uh, understand uh, this particular piece of legislation, which is called the Tribal Family Fairness Act. You can Google it. Um, and these are some of the major provisions. And really the, the major idea behind this piece of legislation is it would actually give tribes the capacity to do the good work that they want to do and so that they can provide tribal travel for services equitably in the same way that states get resources to operate their programs. We're just trying, we're just talking about equity and the ability to operationalize these programs. Tribal children should not have access to less resources than other children in the child welfare system. You saw from the data what the ramifications of inequitable funding does. So Angelique, I wanna um, go to the final slide in your deck in just a second, but I wanna actually ask John a question first, um, which is, so we've heard Alan's solution. We've heard some legal changes. Uh, at the beginning, you mentioned pathways program and you also mentioned kind of really involving those who are impacted in policy. So do you wanna just say a bit about how you're working in your sphere of influence to build solutions to these really complex problems? Yeah, um, well, let me first say that I absolutely agree with Angelique that that we ought to have that standard, that ICWA standard um, for everybody, um, particularly for African-Americans. I mean, I would, but I think it's for everybody if we can do that. Um, the other thing is, um, so, how are we, so how are we doing this? I mean, I think the, um, that kind of, of, of 
I don't know, abolition or redesign that Alan's talking about, I think one way to, to begin that process, I mean, it's like building an airplane as we're flying it, mm -hmm. but you know, one way to begin that process is, is really taking a look at how are, how are um, localities allocating their funding. And generally, in, certainly in Minnesota, uh, the, the majority of child welfare funding is going toward child protection rather than doing any kind of preventive work. Um, the, one of the, the exceptions to that is uh, in Olmstead, where we have over 50% of our funding in, in child and family is going toward preventive services. And what we found is that, um, and particularly some, I mean, I'll give you an example of a program that I started, um, which uh, called the PACE program, which, which was a program for um, African-American youth who were had uh, attendance problems or behavior problems at home, school, or community, and recognizing that disproportionately those children were reported for, for um, um, suspension, expulsion, they had a lower graduation rate. And so we created basically another door to services rather than an alternative to child protection. And so um, specifically, if a child was reported for uh, ed neglect, they came to PACE for a child of color. They came to PACE first rather than child protection. That had a profound impact on the numbers of, child, of families in child protection of color. Uh, but also it's, it's proven to be effective in um, impacting graduation rates of kids of color and so on. And so the county has invested resources to that particular service or to, to that particular goal. And I think that's partly how we need to, you know, if we're gonna re, re, redo the system, I think that's, that's how we start doing it is, is moving, moving our funding to more of the upstream than downstream. Um, the, family involvement or family voice, I think is important too, because in our, what we're doing in terms of um, our DEI work, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, is really beginning to think deeply about how do we engage families in uh, providing us feedback on the, the kind of harm that we've, we've created. Um, and so, we're really looking at not just inviting, you know, one or two recipients of service to those to meetings that we've, you know, the way we've historically tried to do that, but really trying to create a, um, a, a council, a community council that has, that isn't just advisory, but also has some um, policy, policy making or policy reacting, um, responsibilities and so that we can get a true kind of sense and, and also truly engage families or, or recipients in how in, in the process of how we deliver our services. And I think that's, so anyway, those kinds of changes I think are important. Um, redirecting or reallocating our funding and then also giving more weight to, in a serious way to getting consumer voices. So like all important public issues, this issue is one that's a combination of policy systems and practice, right? And so I'm just mindful of time and wanting to thank these experts because they're each trying to make change in this system from where they sit for the expertise and knowledge and the path that they've been on and trying to figure out how do they lever up and I think this last slide Angelique put together, but I think all the four of these people are focused on this key question on the left-hand side, which is how does a family-centered anti-racist, anti-colonial system look? Um, so with that, I wanted to uh, thank you all again. Uh, for those of you who've been with us, um, the recording uh, and the slides will be coming to you next week. Um, there will be additional resources too if you want to dive more deeply in. 
Um, and then uh, these are the speakers and, and they said that you can connect with them after if you would like. Um, but again, my intention here was to bring a really important uh, topic to a larger conversation. And um, I'm just really grateful for both the attendance and the expertise that were brought by these colleagues. So if we were in a big room, we'd go, woo, maybe if we still have to go, woo, we're getting some of it in the chat. Um, but thank you all for attending. And these topics are really upsetting and really important for us all to stay grounded because these are real kids and real families. And as Tessa said so brilliantly, the consequences extend for multiple generations. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.